Drive Time on RTE Radio 1, sponsored by Zurich. We believe small actions can have great impact. Take a small action today. Speak to a financial broker about a Zurich pension. Drive Time on RTE Radio 1 with Sarah McInerney and Cormac O'Hara. Well, you will no doubt have heard of the phrase long COVID and about the ongoing effects COVID-19 can have on people who contract the virus. Well, a group of people in Ireland have come together to offer support and patient advocacy to people experiencing ongoing symptoms of COVID-19. Neve Roach is a member of Long COVID Ireland and she joins us now on the line. Um, Neve, I, we might start with, with your own story because I believe you caught the virus earlier on, early on in, in the pandemic. Hi, yes, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, early on. I was in March 2020. Um, I had travelled abroad for work uh, in the beginning of the month, and uh, five days after I came back, I started to become unwell, uh, which it later turned out to have been COVID. And and did you get severely ill? Um, no, I wasn't too bad. I mean, I went in for one A and E visit, um, and uh, but I was sick for about two weeks. On and off, um, it was a very strange illness, I would have to say. Um, but on the in the general scheme of things, I wasn't, you know, certainly wasn't seriously ill. All right. So you would have seen all the coverage, obviously, of it at the time as we were starting yeah. to learn about the virus. Um, yeah. And then I assume you were waiting for yourself to get better. Yes. Yeah. And actually, to be honest, I felt felt fine for a couple of months late afterwards. I was felt I was fully recovered. And actually, it was only towards the su- end of the summer. Uh, in 2020 that I became really ill again with a relapse with what seemed like COVID again almost um, with you know difficulty breathing terrible brain fog extreme muscle weakness and um, a, it wasn't it wasn't a second dose of COVID it turned out to be a, some kind of relapse and the start of what, was long, what we call long COVID now. And what sort of help was available for you? Um, well I mean I suppose was I, I did I went into A and E a few times. Um, I ended up going in for a few days into my local hospital and getting several tests, many tests actually. Um, but in the end, nothing showed up, uh, and it was a case of going home to recuperate. Uh, and there wasn't really a whole lot of help. Uh, I would have to be honest now and say there wasn't a whole lot of help available in terms of how to manage the symptoms or how to, you know, basically rest was the only thing that was mm. kind of prescribed. You know, because effectively, in a lot of instances, doctors don't really know what's wrong. Well, this is it. I mean, I mean, I suppose one of the things about long COVID is it's not one specific illness. I mean, there can be many different underlying problems going on, um, like anything from myocarditis, which a good number of our members have been diagnosed with, uh, to a sort of a kind of chronic fatigue-like symptoms. Um, some people have developed a whole range of new allergies, um, some people have neurological issues, um, so there's a whole myriad of different things going on. So there's, um, it's probably very difficult from a medical point of view to figure out what needs to be treated in the first place. And um, where are you at now in terms of your own health? Um, so I'm a lot better than I was uh, this time last year, um, but I'm still, I suppose, relapsing and remitting. Um, my most recent relapse was in mid October, so it took me about. Or four or five, maybe six weeks, I suppose, really, to get over that. So oh, sort of and sorry to, to interrupt you, Neve. What yeah. does a relapse look like then? So can I take it that you are you get to a point where you effectively feel fine, normal, and, and then you have a relapse? And, and what, what, how, does that, how does that play out? Well, for me, it's um, not really kind of the fatigue sort of stuff that you'd expect. For me, I get a lot of um, muscle weakness and... Um, a bad episode would involve actual paralysis of some of my limbs and um, sometimes I can't speak because my jaw closes because my muscles relax shut um, so a really bad relapse for me might be maybe up to 24 hours where I can't move my legs or arms um, and sometimes I can't speak for some of that time so that's that's a severe relapse for me and then after that I would gradually regain my strength and it might take I might be bedridden for a few days and then gradually, you know, improve on that, from that. That, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> well, it's funny that the, the goalposts kind of move, you know, when you sort of deal, I think anybody who's dealing with a chronic illness, you know, 
becomes kind of <laughs> used to certain things, which you mightn't expect. <laughs> mm. But, uh, you know, you kind of go, OK, well, here it's come again. And now all I can do is relax. All I can do is rest. You just have to deal with it. And there are certain points where you go, OK, well, maybe I'll go to hospital on this occasion. Uh, and then there are some that are not so bad. And you go, OK, well, I can just deal with this at home. So Yeah. And I suppose maybe you can, you can get some comfort from knowing from previous experience that, that it does pass. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That is that is a, a huge comfort, comfort of course. And the first time I relapsed, it was, it was terrifying because I never, you know, you don't know what's going to happen next. So now at least that I have that comfort. Yeah. Um, but in terms of then what doctors have said to you, I, I know uh, there's all the focus really from the medical and scientific community, understandably, has been on, on vaccines and, tr- and treatment of, of, of COVID. Yeah. Um, so I know from speaking to doctors myself over the last year and a half that, you know, there hasn't obviously been as much focus on, on this aspect of it, the long COVID and long term treatment of, of people who are suffering long term effects. Um, have yeah. you noticed any improvement over the course of the pandemic in terms of the knowledge or the help or the supports that are available? for people um well i think i think uh, to be honest i think it's really mixed i think you know it's look at the look of the draw really depending on who your gp is and what consultants you happen to see um if they may have some knowledge and they may have an interest there's definitely been an increase in awareness um but it doesn't necessarily lead to always better outcomes i don't think because there's still not that whole lot of clarity about how to how it can be treated I, th- I do think we could learn an awful lot from other countries. I think in some other countries are ahead of us in terms of what they're doing and how they're treating long COVID patients. So there's still, there's, there could, it could be better, I think, still. Um, and what, what could be done that would be better that you've seen done in other countries? Uh, well, the, well, for example, in, in England, they opened up 40 long COVID clinics a- across England um, so that, you know, there would be access for you know a wide wide population um, to these multidisciplinary clinics, here in Ireland we have some long COVID clinics, but they are hugely biased to Dublin, which is understandable, of course, because that's where our, you know largest population centre is. But pretty much none in the regions um, where I am in the northeast. We have our local hospital, Our Lady of of Lourdes, serves five hundred thousand people, and it doesn't have a long COVID clinic. And um, mm. so you know there's a huge disparity in in um, in you know equity of access to long COVID clinics, and there's no real clear referral pathways either for GPs. I mean, they may even if there is a long COVID clinic, they may not know about it. They may not know that if it's possible to send somebody there if they're in the right catchment or not. Okay, so um, a sort of a national strategy really around it is is is, is what's needed by the sounds of that. Um, yeah. I mentioned at at the beginning that uh, the Long COVID Ireland group has I think over two thousand members. Um, yeah. What's your sense of of the prevalence of this from speaking to people? Uh, um, you know, how, like oh, well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of different studies on it, um, and it sort of varies from between ten to thirty percent of mm. um, COVID patients going on to develop long COVID. Um, you know, but it does depend a lot on what's defined as long COVID. Some some uh, scientists take it to be kind of twelve from twelve weeks or more than twelve weeks uh, post uh, acute acute illness onset to be, you know, long COVID. So, but it's very variable. I mean, I know that we, d- we don't, obviously in our membership, we don't have nearly all of the long COVID sufferers in Ireland. I know there are a lot of people out there, they may be fatigued and they may not realise that actually it's, you know, because of, of an earlier COVID infection. Um, uh, and obviously not everybody's on Facebook either. So mm. I'm sure that there's, a, I'm sure it's hugely prevalent in the population. And it's not just in adults as well, don't forget some children can go on to develop long COVID too, unfortunately. Okay. So if people would, if they're listening and they maybe are concerned or worried or interested uh, for more information, Long COVID Ireland is the name of your group and they'll find that on Facebook if, if, if yeah. people want to sort yeah. of get involved and, and get, get some yeah, yeah. support there. Uh, All yeah, right. They'll get great support. Great. Neve Roach, thank you very much for joining us to speak to us this evening. Thank you, Neve. We'll take a break. 